Once again, a very warm welcome to our weekly service of worship. Whether you're a member of Craigie Simonton, a member of Presswick South, or a friend, or a visitor to our online service, it's great to have your company. To begin, we commence with a familiar reading from the Old Testament, a passage that reminds us that there is a time for everything. A time for everything. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. A time for everything and how true that appears. There is a time for everything including words that are so appropriate at this moment in time. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Perhaps highlighting that God has ensured there is a time for everything. However, does this also include our worship, especially with regards to the traditional view of prioritising the seventh day unlike the previous six. Indeed, for most church members, Sunday morning means a church service. That's the way that many of us have been brought up. But is that now changing? Well, over the past few weeks, I've sought to test your mind by asking certain questions. Indeed, we've already had spot the difference and name the location. However, I want to now ask a question of you all that I'm sure everyone will be able to answer. And the question relating to a sense of time is this. Quite simply, what day is this? What day is this? Now, as you watch this online service, you can obviously answer very easily that question. Everyone, I would assume, will be able to state what day this is. But, and here's the point I want to make, not everyone will have the same answer. Not everyone will say the same day. Of that, I'm fairly certain. And the reason I know is that these days modern technology allows us to continually examine statistics and data which can provide us with interesting feedback. For example, Tosh Lubeck, whose voice you've just heard on our first reading, was able recently to email me some information he had collated regarding the online services. And from this information, Tosh was able to note that there is, on a Monday, a spike shown by the red peak, shown that on a Monday there is an upsurge in those that normally are tuning in. Tosh was also able to denote that there is also a slight surge on those viewing on a Saturday. And therefore, from this information, it does appear that not everyone watches this service on a Sunday, that some will tune in during the rest of the week with Monday and to an extent Saturday also proving to be popular when obtaining an overall impression. So the question, what day is this, will therefore receive different answers. Reflecting in this period of lockdown and as people adapt to different routines, then traditional methods of worship have well and truly been subjected to change. This was also endorsed by an article I read last week by Dr. Krish Kandaya, 
a lecturer in theology at Oxford. In an article entitled The Benefits of Going to Church in Your Pyjamas, Dr. Kandaya pointed out that the church he normally attends has, like so many other churches, closed during lockdown, but is now also, like so many churches, offering an online service each week. In addition, and according to a survey recently carried out, the article also pointed out that 24% of British adults say they have watched or listened to a religious service since the lockdown began. And from this, 5% say they have never been to church in their life. Another interesting point highlighted by Dr. Kandaya relates to an issue which I believe is often very difficult for regular church members. Indeed, for those regular church members watching, I'm sure that at times there has come a plea from the minister during a Sunday service to perhaps bring someone new to church the following week. Why not invite a neighbour, a friend or a family member to come with you to church next week? And in response, if most members are honest, they often find this a very difficult and awkward challenge. And therefore, most church members shy away from inviting someone new to accompany them to church the following week. However, apparently during the lockdown, church goers have found a new burst of confidence and are now inviting neighbours, friends and family to tune in to the weekly service of worship. Church goers perhaps across the garden fence saying to their neighbours, here you should go online and see what our church is streaming each week. Or church goers perhaps phoning or emailing, texting family and friends, promoting the weekly service online and saying, why not give it a go? I hope that resonates with the regulars at Craigie Simonton and Presswick South. Indeed, the reality is that generally at the moment, churches are attracting thousands more to join services online. People who wouldn't normally come to a church on a Sunday morning. Possibly also including many people unable to attend church due to illness or disability or perhaps shift work. Of course, I'm also aware as highlighted last week there are those, including regular church members, who don't possess the necessary devices to go online and have felt left out. Good news about that later. But generally those watching or listening to a service of worship, whether Sunday, Monday or Saturday or whatever, it has increased church attendances, albeit online. I'm aware, for example, that at the moment, according to the statistics, I'm currently speaking to more people than I normally would in a Sunday morning from the combined sanctuaries of both Craigie Simonton and Presswick South. Indeed, Dr. Kandaya ends his article with these words. There has never been an easier time to visit church. You can even visit several each week. Nobody will mind you leaving halfway through if it's not your cup of tea or if the phone rings. Nobody will notice if you are wearing pyjamas or falling asleep during the sermon or saying Amen at the wrong time. I'm not sure about the, the reference there to falling asleep during the sermon. Please stay awake when it comes. But you get the drift you get the message that is coming out during this period of lockdown. The fact that generally we currently have a church that is much more accessible. For some that's good news. Perhaps for others there is a more cautious approach. After all, when the lockdown ends and church services return to a so-called sense of normality, what will then happen? Will we see an upsurge in numbers attending 
or a decrease. I must admit, I wouldn't like to forecast what will happen once a semblance of normality returns. I simply relay this information to you, highlighting what has been happening during the lockdown to church services, while possibly posing questions that you may wish to consider regarding the future. It's a difficult situation to be in. I often think that it's good that Sunday in general is a more relaxed day, where church members prioritise coming together within a church building. In addition, I'm aware that church t attendance is also about friendship and fellowship, coming together after the service in the hall to enjoy a tea or a coffee in the company of others, engaging in conversation, finding out how other people and their families are getting on. That's such an important part of church life and follows very much the pastoral ministry of Jesus. But let's remember that Jesus carried out a great deal of his ministry by sharing food and fellowship with those he encountered. And therefore, if we're honest, I'm sure there are many regular church members who are greatly missing that sense of fellowship on a Sunday morning. It's obviously not the same in line, albeit the sofa is perhaps more comfortable than a pew or a hall chair. It's quite a complex issue. And in addition, I'm aware that the majority of people, Sunday in periods of normality are almost like any other day, with shops open and even large sporting events taking place. While churches in many ways, if the truth be told, seek to accommodate the minority, the members, by opening their doors, by ringing the church bells and striving to send out a message that God still exists. I'm not sure what the future will hold. However, perhaps what we have to derive from this period of time is that while there are advantages and disadvantages, the church perhaps has to ensure that a sense of adaptability and flexibility continue to prevail that we strive to try and reach out to more people in our modern era, that we seek continuing to provide greater accessibility to the elderly, to the disabled, to those who work on a Sunday, while also ensuring that pastoral care, friendship and fellowship within the church are not ignored or weakened, but actually complemented by modern technology. And that the church in so many different ways continues to be a beacon of faith in whatever format is appropriate and wherever the presence of faith is required. Let us pray. Lord God, we live not only in challenging times, but in times of uncertainty. A time in which we have noted an upsurge in those who have watched or listened to the service of worship online. Therefore we acknowledge that we live in a time where tradition is often being replaced by modern technology. A time in which, if we are honest, the church has become more accessible and accommodating. O oh Lord, we therefore pray that as we look to the future, the church and the ways of Christianity may continue to attract new followers, that a renewed sense of confidence and strength may prevail. In the meantime, we pray for all regular church-going members who are missing the sense of friendship and fellowship, which is so often important in their spiritual lives. We pray for those members who currently don't have the necessary technology to join us each week for online services and therefore feel a great emptiness in their current lives. And we pray for those who perhaps have no real affiliation to the church, but in recent times have sought to embrace the availability of religious services. O Lord God, may all those we have mentioned know of your presence and your comfort. And as we look to the future, we pray that whatever our views, 
that we may seek to allow the church to evolve and plan, ensuring that Christianity may remain a prominent part, not just in our lives, but of society in general. And remind us also, Lord God, that we do belong to an enduring and persevering faith, highlighted by your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For when Jesus walked on this earth, many of the religious hierarchy accused Jesus of promoting radical views instead of upholding tradition. For example, we remember how Jesus healed on the Sabbath and was criticised by the Pharisees. O oh Lord, as we look to the future, help us to find the right balance. To acknowledge that a Sunday is special. To ensure that the church remains a visual symbol of faith. To provide friendship and fellowship for those who come together in worship. But help us also to be accessible and adaptable. That we may never lose sight that Jesus has commissioned us to make disciples of all nations. May we therefore go forward with faith, determination and flexibility, remembering all that Jesus achieved during his ministry that so often was perceived as untraditional and even threatening. Indeed, in Christ's name we come before you, Lord God, with a sense of unity and purpose brought now together by the words of Jesus. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And now we have the words and music of a very traditional hymn, but also a hymn that highlights as we move forward, whatever road we take, we must trust in God. Courage, brother, do not stumble.
And now a treat for those who perhaps have a preference to a more modern approach to hymns and music. Last week I highlighted the problems that we encounter with regards to copyright. Well, thanks to the endeavours of Alison Lubeck, combined by the follow-up of Arthur Mackay, I'm delighted to say that we've now been granted permission to use the words and the music of one of Britain's greatest modern hymn writers. Born in 1950, the son of a Baptist minister, this artist started writing songs in the late 1960s. And since then he has gained great fame with an abundance of well-known Christian modern hymns, perhaps his most famous being Shine, Jesus Shine. I am of course referring to Graham Kendrick and I'm now delighted to welcome the talents of Graham to our service of worship today. And therefore sit back and listen to what else but shine, Jesus, shine. Oh, 
More from Graham Kendrick next week. Our reading today comes from the very complex last book of the Bible, namely the book of Revelation. And in this particular passage, it refers to the church in Philadelphia, which was located in what today is known as Turkey. There it was the centre of a continuous trade where people were continually coming and going. But like many of the churches in that early period, there was also the threat of persecution. But despite such a threat, and because of this wonderful location where people were always passing by, those Christians were told to be strong and resolute, to hold on to the ways of God, with the wonderful encouragement, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. To the Church in Philadelphia To the angel of the Church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens no one can shut, and what he shuts no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. One of the attractions of ministry, I believe, is the diversity that each day brings. No two days are the same and therefore a wide range of tasks and duties often come my way. And even with the current lockdown, that sense of diversity continues, especially through the phone calls I receive, the emails that come in, not to mention preparing for the service of worship. Hence, although restrictions are imposed, ministry and the church naturally go on. And therefore, there is also a sense in which we have to keep the doors of faith open. For while we, of course, are in the midst of a very challenging time, hopefully, as already pointed out in my opening remarks, the church has adapted and become more accessible, particularly with the aid of modern technology. In other words, the church in recent times, while although physically and practically doors have remained closed, I would argue that the doors of faith have well and truly remained open. And I would even go further to say that new doors have been opened. Now, you could also argue that part of the task of the church in general is to continually open doors that allow the church to evolve and connect with society in general. But if we're honest, it doesn't always happen like that. For sometimes in any congregation you can get people who are so comfortable with the status quo that they don't want their church, their church hall, even their membership within a church organisation affected by change. It's a case of just leave me alone within my comfort zone. In other words, what they do is periodically close the door on others. And yet we live today in a world where often striving to open doors is perceived as a worthwhile task. 
Just recently, for example, the Queen was involved in making two public addresses to the nation. Indeed, if we're honest, then the monarchy in recent decades has literally sought to reinvent the role and the profile of the royal family. Seeking to make the royal family more in tune and more integrated with people in general. And that has resulted in times of new doors being opened. For example, I always remember back in November of 1992 when a fire caused great devastation to Windsor Castle. £40 million was needed to restore the castle back to its former glory. And debates arose where the money would come from. And therefore, in response to the quest to raise funds, the Queen decided to open Buckingham Palace to the public. An open door therefore provided the public with an opportunity to visit a place of great interest. But it also helped to quell the criticism that the taxpayer would foot the bill for the restoration at Windsor. Indeed, whether it's the Queen, the ordinary person in the street or the church, open doors are the wonderful ability to create new opportunities and create a greater sense of understanding and communication. For when doors are closed, uncertainty and division are never far away. And for those associated with the church, then the opening of doors should always be a priority. But if we're honest, it doesn't always happen. As highlighted, there are those that want the status quo to remain, where they can linger in a personal comfort zone. And yet, irrespective of our own personal desires, the accessibility of the church should never be determined by our own opinions, but by the examples of Christ. For it's Jesus that the church seeks to serve, not personal cravings. In our reading today, we turn to the very last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Not the easiest book to understand. It's a very prophetic book, full of visions and imagery, In chapters 2 and 3, there are letters written to different churches with instructions and encouragement from the ascended Christ on how to truly serve God. Now, the church in Philadelphia, which our reading referred to, was located in what today is known as Turkey. It was a centre of continuous trade where people were constantly coming and going. There, the Christian church was not free from persecution or trouble, and indeed the author used the phrase synagogue of Satan, which perhaps alluded to the fact that persecution was actually coming from certain Jewish quarters. But in that letter, because of their wonderful location where people were always passing by, those Christians were told to be strong and resolute, to hold on to the ways of God with the wonderful encouragement, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. What a wonderful phrase. At this moment in time, ministers and elders should have been attending the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland in Edinburgh. And obviously at the moment, it is cancelled due to the coronavirus. Now, while this is a business meeting, it also prioritises, as you would expect, the importance of worship, and often there are guest speakers who are invited to address the gathering. I always remember being at the assembly a good few years ago when the then Archbishop of Canterbury attended the assembly as a guest. In a speech to the assembly, Dr Rowan Williams spoke about that phrase from the book of Revelation. I have placed before you a door, an open door, that no one can shut. In his passionate speech, he spoke of the need to hold the door open for those who wish to encounter God like ourselves. But he also spoke that in addition, what we have before us is an open door into the life of the community around us. 
In other words, what he was saying was that we are custodians of an open door in both directions. Holding the door open to the community to enter and holding the door open for the presence of God. As an illustration to that open door, Rowan Williams spoke of the Reverend John Morgan of the United Reformed Church. In 1968, in a place called Pennering in South Wales, a new housing estate was built with over 1,000 homes to take the overspill from the Rhondda Valley. Deliberately moving into a community with no established church life of any kind and remote from any traditional church buildings and habits, the Reverend John Morgan and his wife Nora built up a regular pattern of worship in the heart of the estate, actually converting two middle-sized council houses into a church centre with a cafe and a second-hand clothes shop. The practical usefulness of this to the community meant that people sensed an open door. And when they came to drink coffee or to shop, they also had the opportunity to drop in to a prayer space. Increasingly, there was collaboration with community services, including the development of a clinic. The church's visibility working in support of the visibility of community resources. This was a community where an open door could be seen. I wonder how such an open door policy relates to the church of today and perhaps the church that we are part of. Indeed, if we return to the book of Revelation and continue reading chapter 3, then in the very next letter written, this time to the church of La Odyssea, then the ascended Christ in his revelation continues the theme of open doors. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Well, at this moment in time, what we have often termed a period of shutdown has ironically opened many new doors as people in a very practical way have actually sought to carry out the work of Christ in local communities. And I'm also aware that churches have also, in a sense, sought to open new doors also. Office bearers communicating with members, offering assistance, if required. The needs of charities like Christian Aid and food banks have been highlighted with guidance on how to continually offer support. And of course, as already pointed out, doors have been opened with regards to worship, making our faith more accessible and adaptable to many more people. New doors being opened in a time of restriction. And therefore, perhaps, when a sense of normality returns and we have the opportunity to reflect on how the church adapted to this period of shutdown, it will hopefully be with the realisation that, ironically, many new doors were opened. For surely, at the end of the day, opening doors should be at the heart of any Christian community. And may we never forget that, reflected in our faith to God and in our discipleship to those we encounter, whatever the circumstances. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we belong to a faith that seeks to welcome, a faith that knows no barriers, a faith that often accepts us as we are. Therefore, allow us to open doors that ensure acceptance and accessibility are prioritised. For if we are honest, Lord God, sometimes we are more intent in closing doors and retaining a sense of comfort where the status quo prevails. Lord God, help us to follow the examples of Jesus, seeking to make disciples in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. 
Indeed, Lord, we are all aware that in recent times many doors have been opened to combat the threat of COVID-19. But ironically, in a time of shutdown and restrictions, opportunities have arisen to ensure that the ways and teachings of Jesus are available for all. Therefore, we give thanks for those who have sought to bring food to the hungry, including the many charities and volunteers who have opened doors that have provided nourishment and support, helping in particular those individuals and families that are currently experiencing poverty and unemployment. We give thanks for those who have sought to bring guidance to others who are unsure of how to proceed in this current time, including the many authorities and organisations that have sought to provide the necessary advice and information, opening doors that have given to many a sense of confidence, support and reassurance, helping parents to educate their children, helping people to seek assistance when domestic violence flares, helping individuals to receive the appropriate counselling when life threatens to overwhelm them. O oh Lord God, so many individuals, organisations and charities have also sought to open their additional doors in times of great challenge despite increased pressure. And for this we offer all our thanks. And as always we remember in our prayers those who have sought to ensure that the doors of health care have remained open, continually offering care and compassion to all those who are suffering from sickness and disease. To them we offer our thanks. And Lord, in this day may we not forget those who are struggling to keep their doors open, including certain care homes who sadly have suffered great loss in recent times. And we also think of businesses, shops, hotels, restaurants, where uncertainty now prevails and doors may not reopen. Be with them. And finally, may the church continue to strive to be active in the lives of all, seeking to help where it can, ensuring that the doors of faith continue to open making Christianity accessible to all, following very much in the ways of Christ. And this we offer in our Saviour's name. Amen. And now we have the words and the music to the hymn, All My Hope on God is Founded.
And now let's close on an upbeat note today, just to let you know for any family and friends that would like to listen to the service but don't have the necessary devices, then they can now use their landline phone or indeed their mobile. Simply call 01292 That's 01292-434-505. As you will be aware, the services are generally between 30 to 45 minutes long. While there are no additional charges for calling that number, the telecom provider's charges will apply. And the charges will be the same as calling any 01292 number. If a mobile phone is used and if the contract has inclusive minutes, then this call will be covered by that. And naturally, this is an alternative for people that can't access the YouTube service. And on that happy note, let me now close with a blessing. May we all go forth with hope and peace in our hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all and those whom you love, this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>